can you see my skin through this? I've realized that it's... it's no. no, it's fine, because it's, it's, it's like, yeah, nearly, new, nearly just, new hoodie time. <laughs> just get those patches. For me, it's the same, I have the same strategy as with friends as I do clothing. It's, it's, you know, I can't have a new one until one of them's gone. Okay. Right? So if, like, <laughs> clothes, whole new piece of clothes. Friend dies. I'm in the market for a new friend. You know, I might go out. I might your elbow patch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean it to sound like that, but it is actually what's happened, isn't it? <laughs> so Emma left me, and now <laughs> new friend. New every friend. cloud. <laughs> uh, I'm honoured. I'm honoured to be your elbow patch. <laughs> So, right, okay, <laughs> after my episode of lots of code, people will be sad about it, but you're here to cheer us all up with... Hooray! Um, we're going to chat about some animation stuff, Whoop. Um, specifically animating the impossible. Oh, which... that sounds difficult. <laughs> sounds impossible, but it's, but it's not, because otherwise it would be a very short talk. That's true. It's the next slide. Just, you can't. You can't. Hey! Done. <laughs> Let's go home. Um, so, I guess we're going to start with like a really simple animation. All right. Just going to take a little look at some different types of animation that you kind of commonly find on the web. Mm -hmm. So, really simple one. We've got a button. We're going to hover the button. It moved down a little bit and moved it changed color. Down a little bit and changed color. Brilliant. Yeah, it did. So. You know, the color change. Now it's changing to code. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> the color change is really nice and simple because um, you know, you're just kind of changing a state. The button is staying exactly where it is. You're just changing um, like a property on hover. So that's nice and simple. And I believe we've recently started doing that entirely on the compositor in ah, Chrome. Nice colors. Yeah, background colors. Background colors. That's yeah. really exciting. Not background images, just colors. Ah. The Chrome fact there for you. Thanks. I love it when you <laughs> sprinkle Chrome facts in. <laughs> so here's another kind of more complex animation. So we've got a little header bar here. And on scroll, we want to make it smaller. Very nice. Yeah. Shall we do that again? Oh. <laughs> oh. Brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. A nice scroll linked animation. Yeah. Perfect. So we've got scroll linked animations coming up. Um, for now, you can kind of use an animation library, um, perhaps like GSAP using scroll trigger, um, or you could, you know, calculate the offset top. Um, and then we've got a few different things that are animating here. So it's a good use for like an animation library that has chained animations because you can kind of put them all together on a timeline. So we've got like the header gets a bit smaller and the inner moves up and the logo and the nav get a bit smaller. So we should say for people who maybe missed the intro in the last episode, you work for GSAP, Green I do, Talk, right? I do, I work for Green Talk. And I'm really excited about this because I, I used to be a Flash developer. So back in the day. Yeah. So I I used Green Talk back in the Flash days. And it's I can't think of another library that has like successfully made that leap that has been around for that long, still doing the thing it does uh, successfully across those two platforms. Yeah, it's been around for a long time. We actually still have like an ap action script forum on really? the GSAP site. It's very occasionally someone will comment and it's like There's a, a big bit of light a blast. and alarm go off. It's Woo! like <laughs> we, <laughs> we need a flash contractor. That. Yeah, I, I I wasn't around in the flash days. I'm not that old, but Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's like a little bit more complicated. We've got the the dreaded list reordering. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're kind of shuffling things actually about in the DOM. Um, and often with list reordering, you might be adding items into the DOM or taking items out of the DOM. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very difficult to animate between because you've got two completely different states. Because these have layout as well, right? Like, yeah. So, yeah, how, if you merely just rearrange them, it's just they're just going to pop into place. Yeah. So how how does that happen smoothly? Because also, I guess you, if you did just animate them around, then that's bad for accessibility because now they're visually in a different order, but they're not semantically in a different. Yeah, order. Yeah, like animating, you know, changing the flex order is quite bad for accessibility. Of course. Um, so 
yeah, and also if you're going to add an item into the DOM, it's just going to flash into existence. If you take it out, flash out of existence. So it's a tricky thing to solve. Oh, um, is this a masonry layout? Is that similarly, what call yeah, masonry layouts. Like things on the web are complicated because things move around. We have like responsive screens. Um, you have content that's getting pulled in dynamically. You don't necessarily know where an element is when it gets clicked on. So doing something like this, where oh. you click on an element and it expands out into a full screen kind of image, it's actually quite tricky. And I think that a lot of people would try and approach it maybe like this, with like animate the width and height. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that this is like a kind of modal thing. So it's, yeah, even if you scroll the background, this is going to stay. Yeah, yeah. fixing the view. Right, OK. But then you're animating between a position relative element and a position fixed element. Mm. You're pulling the element out of the grid. So then how does the rest of the grid react? Because right. now there's a space. Because if you just resized it where it was, you'll have all the problems with like if you have any overflow hidden or scroll or something in the way. It, it, yeah, I guess you need to pop it out of there and put it somewhere else. Yeah, it? and it's going to cause reflows and all sorts of all sorts of Un <laughs> unwanted things. So this would be what I think a lot of people would attempt to do, transitioning width and height. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be affecting layout. Um, do you want to tell us about browser things? Uh, OK. <laughs> okay <laughs> to go. These are three things which happen. Um, <laughs> or sometimes only one of them happens. Like it's, You either end up with composite, paint and composite, or layout, paint and composite, depending on how much or what particular things you change. So yeah, as you say, width is going to do the gonna layout do thing. Going to do layout, yeah. So ideally, we just want to be animating things on the composite side of the spectrum. Um, and then we're going to get buttery smooth animations. Mm -hmm. So ideally, what we'd want to do with this little modal is to transition just the transforms. Mm -hmm. Yes, because then that can all just happen on the compositor and happen all in a different thread, and JavaScript can't do bad things to the animation. Yeah, yeah. All right. So how do we do this? So we're going to talk about the flip animation technique. Oh, yeah, excellent. Cool, <laughs> that's fine. I'm OK with it. Let's. <laughs> should, <laughs> should we OK, so flip. Do you have a slide with the word flip on at any point? I, I don't, actually. OK, F-L-I-P, right? Uh -huh. And this is the technique. And the person who came up with that name is Paul Lewis, formerly of this show. And I hate it as a term. I hate it for a number of reasons. I hate it because he clearly came up with the name flip and then tried to figure out what it stood for, which is first, last, last invert, invert, and play. play. No one calls an animation first and last, it's start and end. But I guess that doesn't spell flip. But the mo main problem I have with it the invert. is no, is that people remember it and use uh, it still, and that he has a legacy, and I don't. And he it just did it in the worst possible way. But it's, like, it's I'm over, otherwise, I'm over it. It's, it's fine. It's a handy mnemonic. OK. <laughs> what would you call it? Not allowed to swear on the show. <laughs> so. <laughs> so anyway. The key thing in this is get bounding client wrecked. A lovely Microsoft API. Yeah. This was something that they uh, threw in to the platform. Not just, it was bad old uh, days of IE. They threw this in, didn't standardize it. But it's it's a great API. It is and it super has helpful. Since, has since been standardized and it's in all browsers. I don't like it as much as the SVG version because the SVG version sounds more fun because it's just get, get BB box. Get BB box. Yeah. Which sounds so much more fun than get bounding client wrecked. It's the little Star Wars robot, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, like, get BB box. Oh, that's it's, much nicer. It's very cute. Um, but anyway, even if it doesn't have such a good name, it does the same thing. So it gives you the coordinates of an element in um, relation to the viewport. So you can get like the top and bottom, and the left and right position, and the width and height. So this is the key to kind of figuring out where our elements are and where they end up. And this, yeah, it's relative to the viewport as well. Relative to the right. viewport, yeah. yeah. So to go back to the mnemonic that you love so much. Love it, favorite, <laughs> great. 
first step. Start. <laughs> start. Yeah. We're going to measure the initial position of the element. And this is very handy to do like on user interaction. So like when the user clicks, because then you know that it's correct. Because you know, on load, you might have moved things around a little bit. Dynamic content might have been added, so it's not you're not necessarily going to know where the element is. So this is really handy to do this, like on user interaction. And that should be a quick operation as well, because the browser knows where it is already. And as long as you make this call before changing any styles or anything, it's just returning you information it already has. Yeah. So we're going to check where the element is. End. And end. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to check where it ends up. Lasts and up. Lasts up. <laughs> where it lasts up. Yep. So uh, we're going to check where the element lasts up. And, um, and this is before it's actually painted it to the screen. So we're actually putting the element in its final position. Mm -hmm. And this could be reparenting it in the DOM, um, could be all sorts of things like adding a different class. Um, and then we're going to measure where it lasts lasts up, up. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to do invert. <laughs> I'm trying to do the slide seriously. <laughs> so yeah. we're going to invert it, and we're inverting it by adding some transforms. So it looks like it's in the original place. Like it looks like it hasn't moved at all by this point. So the user's clicked on it. Nothing's happened as far as they're concerned. But mm -hmm. actually, we've put it in its new position and then applied some transforms to put it back visually in the original place. And then play is I'm removing. Fine play. Okay. You're fine with yeah. play? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> play is removing these offsets. And then it animates into its final resting place. And that will be done with like CSS animation or a transition or something like that. Yeah, it could be done with CSS animation, with a transition, with a JavaScript animation library. Like, yeah. So it's easiest to see if you actually kind of look at it happening. I love this. It feels like lifting up the magician's curtain a little bit. <laughs> so we've got the box. It's in the header. And then we've got a main element here. And we're just going to do the first, last, and invert. So we clicked oh, on it. And you can see it's in the ma It's in there, but it's, but it but it's not. But it didn't move That's on amazing. the page. It's magic. <laughs> it really feels like you shouldn't be able to like see behind this bit. Like, yeah. Lifting is... the magician's curtain, definitely. <laughs> So and then the last bit is play. So if we add the play call in, then it moves nice. it into its final position and back again. We Very could just good. do that for ages. That's <laughs> good fun. I do think like I, one of the things that I've come to realize with animations is things are much easier if you rather than animate to something if you're animating from something because then in the final state it's not like. I've done lots of animations where I've maybe like animated the width to a position, um, but then you end up with like an inline style with the width there. It seems much easier to have like the you know the destination width and all that set up, and then just animate it from something yeah. else. And it also means if you're using the web animation API, you don't have to mess around with um, fill, with like fill forwards or fill backwards, which, as far as I can tell, just mess everything up when you use them. Mm -hmm. So this model avoids that. Yeah, GSAP have um, from tweens as well, which like immediately render the initial positions. Oh, nice. When you get to the page, so that's really handy. Um, so yeah, how do we do this with code? Ooh. Big wall of code, fun stuff. So our first <laughs> or start, we're gonna get the <laughs> bounding client rect. Yeah. And then this is last. <laughs> we're just gonna switch up something in the DOM. Um, change a class or reparent something and then get the new positions. So this will probably uh, do a, a synchronous layout um, at that point. And there's there's a lot of uh, performance advice that would maybe say that this is a really bad thing. I think generally, as long as you're only doing one, mm -hmm. then it's fine. So if you were animating two things at once here. Or batch them. Yeah, ex so exactly. So doing it at the same time. Yes. Yeah. So you, if you were animating two things, you would pick up the, the two firsts do the two switch it ups and then do the two lasts. Yeah. And then because then you're only the doing that synchronous time. layout once. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna mention Paul. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm all right with it. It's fine. <laughs> um, he mentioned that there's about a hundred milliseconds 
um, a thousand milliseconds, some number of milliseconds <laughs> <laughs> after someone's done an interaction where they don't actually notice what's happening. So you can kind of use that time to to do the calculations. Yeah, between yeah, about as long as it's less than three hundred, mm -hmm. really, um, and even yeah, it, if you need to do something like a network request, then make sure you're showing like a spinner or or something, or just just kind of have the thing flash so you know it said yes we heard that click and then you've got then your second to do other stuff yeah um so then we're going to get the delta values so this is just a tiny bit of maths it's just getting the difference between the first and last position and then we're just using css transitions here so we're um adding the x and y delta into a transform and then we're doing the play bit nice so this is um, using request animation frame. And this is just saying, like, give us a little, just like a tick, just like a little moment before we animate, just to make sure that you know everything's in the right place. And then, of course, you could use like a JavaScript animation library to do the animation bit. Um, that's also valid. Nice. Um, we actually have a um, flip plugin. So if you wanted Greensock to just handle all of it for you, um, you can use the Flip plugin. Um, and the, this kind of handles a lot of the edge cases with Flip. So Flip, um, doing it in like vanilla JavaScript, if you're doing simple things like we just went through, it's great. But if you get into nested elements that are all flipping, and then you've got to calculate offsets, I think David Corsid called it flip flop. <laughs> 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 when you have nested elements, I can't remember what it stands for, but that's like a little bit more complicated. Um, so with the flip plugin, you can um, look for different properties that are changing as well and animate between them and also deal with nested offsets. Yeah. So, and one of the things that that'll, that'll solve, I imagine, is uh, well, I, I know in my slide framework that I, that I use in in these episodes I've got it, it will scale to fit the screen uh, and that was all great and going well until I needed to do something like this and I used get bounding client rect but I wanted to know the position relative to one of the, the parent slide mm. but because that was then a transform within a transform it all it all broke I kind of actually wanted to, to know like I want the transform relative to another element and I imagine that's exactly what this yeah. kind of thing is just solving for you yeah um, and other little things like um, animating uh, within a grid or a flip flex layout. So pulling out the elements and um, changing them to position absolute while they're animating and then putting them back in their positions. So it's just nice. like a lot of magic behind the scenes. So you grab the state, do your DOM changes just like normal, um, and then use a flip from to animate from the state. Nice and easy. Yeah, and then Ooh. you can do stuff like this really nice and easy. So yeah, flip. That's really nice. Animating the impossible. <laughs> and it's now possible. It's now possible. <laughs>